I want you to imagine a robot. Picture a normal, ordinary, real robot. What does it look like? What comes to mind? Maybe something like this. An industrial machine that's filled with gears and wires made of steel, powered by electricity, and programmed in computer code. And this may be a good description of the robots of yesterday, and maybe even today. But what about the robots of tomorrow? They may be quite different. What if robots didn't have to be so hard and rigid? What if they could be made soft and flexible? What if they could move fluidly? And what if they didn't require wires or electricity? This may seem like another creature from deep under the ocean, but actually it's a new type of soft robot called Octobot. Octobot. It's made of completely soft materials, and it's fabricated as a single component, self-contained. It's powered not by electricity, but by chemical reactions, and it pushes fluid through arteries to muscles in its arms so it can move around. It was made by a new type of 3D printing process, which I helped develop along with researchers at Harvard University. We hope that someday, similar techniques can be used to make medical implants or soft, flexible, wearable devices that can conform to the human body. It may seem a little bit supernatural to be creating creatures out of 3D printing, but this is really just rigorous engineering and lots of experimentation. And it serves as an example of the future of robotics, where they're more lifelike and they are more similar to us and come closer to us. The famous science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. In other words, the more mysterious something is, the more it may seem like a miracle, or in some cases of technology, like a curse. But when I heard this idea, it really resonated with me, because like all true nerds, I grew up on science fiction and fantasy. My heroes were Tony Stark and Harry Potter. And I realized that these are really the same thing. There's not so much difference between a flying car and a flying carpet, except that in science fiction, they try to give some explanation of how things might work, whereas in fantasy, they leave it unknown. Before we knew how atoms and molecules worked, the first scientists, chemists, were alchemists, and they tried to make gold from other elements. And now today, computer programmers who type secret codes into terminals might seem like wizards chanting arcane spells if you don't know how software works. The only difference, <laughs> like myself, the only difference between magic and technology is understanding and knowledge. So when I applied to college, I wanted to gain this knowledge, and they wouldn't let me ma major in wizardry anyway, so I chose engineering. And I wanted to control technology, to understand it and to create it, and to use it for good. And in particular, I chose robotics, because to me, there's mo no more magical t skill than the ability to breathe life into a machine that I can then go do my bidding and maybe fetch me pizza from the fridge. So eventually, my quest to master the dark arts of science took me to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is kind of like Hogwarts, but for nerds. And I went to a place called the Media Lab. This lab is known as being a kind of a window to the future, because so many technologies were invented here decades before they were explored anywhere else in industry or academia. Things like voice-controlled computers, or shape-changing furniture, or digital driving directions for your car. This was the perfect place to see what the future of technology would look like, what problems it would have, and how humans would interact with it. And in particular, I was concerned with the problems that technology creates in modern life. Everything seems to be going faster, everything is more complex. We're inundated with data and information, and we have to make decisions quickly. How do we keep up with the machines? Well, I thought that virtual reality would be one good step. If we could take data and visualize it around us in 3D space, we might be able to interact with digital information in the same way that we can interact with physical objects. But VR today has a problem. It's sight only. You can't reach out and touch something. Your hands go right through the, the objects. And so I created a machine that would allow me to reach out and touch virtual objects in VR. It has a mobile base so it can move around and pins on top that move up and down to change shape. So when I reach out for a virtual ball that only I can see, the machine follows my hand and renders a sphere so that what I see matches what I feel in VR. Now, this is not a traditional robot. <laughs> it doesn't look like normal robots. It doesn't automate any difficult task. It doesn't do manual labor. It actually requires a person there to use it, because without a human there, it's kind of pointless. 
But I think it does offer a window into what the future of robots might look like, or rather, what they won't look like. Because keep in mind, to use this, I'm wearing a headset, so I can't actually see the robot. It's working its magic behind the stage. This has already happened in industry, where already robots are helping us deliver products, but we may not know that they're there. Amazon had a big problem in their warehouses. They have millions of items on their shelves, and when a customer places an order, a worker had to go out into the warehouse, sometimes walking hundreds of meters, and fetch the item from a shelf and bring it back for packaging. And this was not only exhausting for the workers, but it was time consuming and expensive for the company. So their solution, of course, was robots. Lots and lots of robots. Now when a customer order places an order, a robot goes out into the middle of the warehouse and it lifts up the entire shelf with the item that's required. It brings it back, navigating autonomously to avoid other robots, and it brings it to the human who can pick the item off the shelf and package it for the customer. This system works so well that they now have tens of thousands of these robots in dozens of warehouses. But something interesting happened. Amazon still can't hire people fast enough, even with all this automation. Their workforce has more than doubled in the last three years. And the warehouses that have these robots actually employ more people than those that don't. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that they have a long, complicated process. And they only automated one step in that process. But to make the entire thing go faster, they needed more people in the other steps. So if a robot only does part of your job, you still have a job. It might just might be a different job, and you'll have to make sure that you keep up with the robot. So after I worked on these robots and I got my degree in robotics engineering, people asked me, what will the future look like when humans and robots are working together? And I thought of other industrial robots like this. Like the Amazon robots, it's big, it's heavy, it's very powerful, and it does exactly what it's programmed to, no more and no less. It's not very smart, and this makes it kind of dangerous. Because if an industrial robot is programmed to pick something up and move it from here to there, and if I put my hand in its way, it won't know I'm there. It won't care. It'll keep going on its pre-programmed -program path. It might take my fingers with it. This is why industrial robots like this are often kept behind cages. It's not to keep them in. It's to keep humans out of their way. So when I realized this, I thought, this can't possibly be how humans and robots will work together, because most people will never be let in the same room as these things. But there is an example of a robot, a type of robot, that's being used in millions of households every day, right now, safely. This is a robot vacuum cleaner. It's relatively small, lightweight, it doesn't move very fast, so if it bumps into you, it doesn't crush you, it just keeps going around you. As I worked on these products, I realized that the key to making effective consumer robots is uh, not to make them uh, conform to the humans, but to make the, or rather, not to make humans conform to the robots, but to make the robots conform to the humans. They're designed to do one thing and to do it really well. The robot is not going to do your dishes or do your laundry, but it will explore your entire house until it's found every corner and mapped your entire floor and cleaned everything. These robots are designed to work next to humans instead of separate from them. So what have we learned from this magical journey of the future of technology? A future where robots can be printed and creatures can be made out of goo or liquid. A future where objects can appear solid out of nowhere. Where the items that you want come to you and where your broom and your mop can work by themselves and clean your house. Well, the good news is that robots won't do your job. They'll only do part of your job. But the bad news is that, that as the world gets more complex and things move even faster, humans will still have plenty of hard work to do. So the robots are not coming, they're already here. And the revolution may not look like what you think. The robots will be more lifelike, they'll be closer to us, they'll do very specific tasks, and you may not even know they're there. So if you're wondering what the future looks like, don't think about how magical it will be. Think instead how normal it will be. Thank you. <laughs>